Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays Minecraft Dungeons, Dragons and Space Shuttles where we're having some continued adventures in uh, in Blood Magic. So as I've been showing you in previous episodes, we've got this set up over here in the mob farm. So the mob, mob spawn through there. In fact, I'll show you that because I don't think I have yet. Uh, if I can get up there. There we go. Right, so we have we have a spawning area in here with a couple of these uh, monster spawners, which both produce a, con a steady stream. And there's sorry, one down there as well. They they produce a steady stream of zombies. And eventually, the zombies will jump off and end up down in the bottom there, where they'll they stand on these on these um kin not not kineticators. That's the one to pick up. These things that push them around anyway, which drops them down the hole there. And that puts them in over here, where they'll sort of wander around and they'll stand on the blood altar there, where you can poke them with one of the knives to get the life essence out of them. Or, more usefully at the moment, they'll go and stand on the spike plate here, which gradually hurts and ble the, uh, the blood drains out of them into the uh, pedestal underneath and is pumped into these tanks. And as you can see by the fact this tank was, was only about two thirds full when I jumped up to start talking about it and is now completely full, that produces a lot of blood, which is great because we need that as a raw resource. Now, I would bring that with me, but actually at the moment we have a ridiculous supply of it because um, other people, um, various people, including myself and I think certainly Tristan, have been um, going around and just collecting enormous quantities of this. So let's get back, let's head back over to the main base and I'll show you what's been going on over there. So currently it's a rather manual process. You have it, the blood is produced over there in the mob, way over there in the mob farm, and then brought over here where we've got this big stack of tanks. Um, it's not normally quite this big. It's supposed to be sort of one or two poking up above the floor that have just been brought over and are draining down into the into the systems below. But we've been producing so much recently and people have been so busy bringing it over that we now have an absolutely crazy quantity of it. And this is gradually draining down as the... Um, as, as the rest of the factory uses it and what we've so what we've got added in now this the, this is the exciting part from the uh, from the last stream is we've come up with a way of turning um the turning the blood into into life essence which is incredibly useful so, yep so through here we have these are the um the main blood tanks in the back of the um in the, in the back of the tower and as you can see they're they're being kept completely full by the input supply from the um from the deposit room and then from there the blood is drained out into into this system and now this is a ludicrously overcomplicated system that trans transforms the blood into life essence which is great because that's what we that's what we need a lot more of and haven't been able to automate up until now and that's done in this uh, liquid mixer here it turns out that if you if you mix the um if you mix the blood with sodium hydroxide then that purifies it into into the life essence that can then be pumped away down this pipe and that goes into the into the big tanks over here which are now completely empty and can then be used by the blood altar in order to make in order to do all the sort of the the, the runes and the um the slates and things that we've been spending it quite all, all that massive quantity of blood essence on from uh, up until now and so we've got this pipe that as I say, it takes it away here we've got the pipe that brings the blood in and then we've also but we also need the sodium hydroxide of course and that's being made here in this um, alchemical imbuer which brings in salt and water and Apparently that makes sodium hydroxide, so that's great. So we can we've got a supply of water here. That's nice and easy. You just put two water blocks down with an aqueous accumulator between them, and it will generate you infinite free water. So that's quite nice. I mean, I say free. No, no, actually this doesn't even require power, so it is just completely free. It fills up with water, and you can pump that out. It's basically the um, the offshore pump from Factorio, <laughs> so it works in exactly essentially exactly the same way. We're also pumping that out into this mechanical drying basin, and we tried a mechanical drying basin because it's faster and we suspected it would produce less lag than the normal drying basin. This may or may not be true. But that's pulling in, in water, it then dries the water out and that turns into salt. So essentially we're extracting the salt from water and then we're mixing it back in with water to make sodium hydroxide, and this doesn't make any sense to me from a chemical point of view, but never mind. It's a recipe so we're going to stick with it. We then transfer the salt into this pulverizer, which as the name suggests, turns it into salt, well, turns a salt block into just salt that can be that then be used. And this all needs power. So we've got the uh, these red cables here are bringing power in from somewhere. I don't. Oh yeah, it goes from from down there. And that's powering all the machines here. So getting all of this set up and convincing it to work properly was a, a little bit of an adventure for me because I'm not really 
I'm not that used to um, setting up this sort of automated system in Minecraft. I've done lots of it in Factorio, of course, so I understand the sort of the concept of having these chains of machines running together and producing producing the different things you need. But setting everything up is a, is a little bit new to me. So, um, for example, we go in here. If we look at the configuration, we need to tell it this is a simple one. It's got it's got a single thing that it has, and it's it's, it's surrounded by orange. So that means it's there, the the output is the orange one. And then over here, you can choose where where that that goes. So I could make orange come out on the side here if I wanted to, and that would mean it pump pump water out to the side if there's anything to accept it but in this case we want it to come out the top so we've got top front bottom left right and back i'm pretty sure and in this case we want the water to come out the top so i've made that orange so it is and that's been pumped out into these two this one is apparently simpler and therefore doesn't need any of this sort of configuration going i think it depends on which mod the system has come from so this is a, a thermal expansion system so it requires configuration like that this is integrated dynamics so it doesn't this is also thermal expansion so here we've got um both actually both inputs seem to be blue and then the output is orange so over here we've got um accept input in from any side except the front and the right hand side and the right hand side is an output so that's again it's fairly simple um it'll accept the inputs as long as and i think because one of these is a solid and one and one is a liquid it's a bit more flexible about um what goes where and you don't need to do any um any clever um and you don't need to be too clever about it then over here, this one comes from Nuclearcraft, and this is a bit more complicated. Uh, it's got a different interface, so I click on the side configuration here, and we then see two input. The two input tanks are this sort of turquoisey colour. Output is red, and then you can also pull in. I think you can also pull in upgrade devices on off the off item ducts as well if you want to, which is quite clever, um, but possibly a bit overkill for what I'm doing at the moment. But yeah, so in order to get this working. Um, yeah, we need to say that tank comes from in from the front and not anywhere else. This tank comes in from the top and not anywhere else. Output is on the on the right and not again not anywhere else. And we need to filter. Um, I can't remember what this does. I don't want to touch it because I did earlier and it broke everything. So I'm not going to touch that now. But you need to be very very careful to make sure all of these are correct and there's no overlap. So I, ha I ran into a bit of a problem with this before. Oh turn all of these off so you see yes here we go this is this is for the um you've got lots of different options here so if i could say i want to take in i want to input a a module from the top or i want to output modules to the top so you've got all this yeah it's complicated stuff which i don't really want to, to mess around with any uh, too much if i can possibly avoid it because it'll probably break the whole system once again um i did that before we ended up with um the uh what do you call it um sodium hydroxide being pumped out down here and that just broke the whole system and I am and it needed lots and lots of clean up and there's still a tank of sodium hydroxide knocking around somewhere that we haven't been able to do anything with so yeah it's important to try and get all of this right and make sure it, and, and set it up nicely this one is more complicated than the other one I don't like this interface as much but it it does allow a bit more configuration and complicated stuff to be done so I suppose technically it's kind of better but it is a bit more annoying you can also use the crescent hammer to rotate all of these machines. So on these ones, for example, um, yeah, you can't actually input or output on the front. So you need to make sure this is rotated in, in, in a way that the front is one of the visible sides rather than one of the ones that's supposed to be doing something, or it's just not going to work. So yes, this is all rather... It's not complicated. It's one, two, three, four, five machines working together to do to, to do a, um, a string of processes. But because it was my first attempt at making this sort of automation system in Minecraft, it was quite complicated for me to do. And um, I'm quite pleased that I did. Well, I eventually managed to get it working with some help because basically it was this. It was the, the problem was this one. I did. I didn't realize that if you go in and set this as an input, it can or it can still also it could still also be set as an output here uh, in which case you try and pump the, both things in and out on the same pipe and that, that doesn't work but i think what i got what i'd actually managed to do was have this as an out i'm not sure what i'd done i think i whatever it was the wrong stuff was going down this pipe and it was, it was breaking things so that was bad but it is working it is as you as you as you see this this machine is running and it's producing a bit of life essence which is going out down the pipes and into the into the into the tanks over here now these tanks are empty because i've been doing some upgrades on the on the um on the blood altar so as you'll remember hopefully the uh, the blood altar itself there that thing on its own is a tier one blood altar 
if you put these blank runes around it, or runes of some sort around it, like the, like I have done here, then it becomes a tier 2 blood altar. In order to make it a tier 3, you then need another set that are down a level level down and an extra block out, yes, which is this, this row that comes around here and goes all the way around. And then for a tier 4, you need another ring all the way around here, which I've also put in. You can have these gaps in it, so it just has to be the ones that are more or less opposite the previous row. And this, whilst adding in the extra... Tier, bring, bring, increasing the tier level I think changes what recipes you can do. The most interesting part of it is it then allows you to put in upgrade modules or upgrade runes. So all the way along here <clears throat> I've put in one, one, two, three, four, five displacement runes and that means each of these adds I think it's 10% or 20% onto the speed the altar runs at. I talked about this a bit in a previous episode but essentially these make it faster. Uh, faster at bringing in the, the life essence. So before, the limiting factor was how fast we could pull life essence out of this tank into the altar. That is no longer the case. Now the fact, now the limiting factor is how, how quickly we can make the life essence again. But that means I've moved the, the bottleneck back a step. So this machine will now run as fast as the, uh, the other previous machine is capable of running. So I can now put in an upgrade module into the, into the machine that's making the life essence and then get the whole system running faster and faster. And running fast is good because we've got this massive chest full of compressed stone that I would like to turn into runes at some point. Because at some point I'm going to want to upgrade all of these all, all of the uh, the runes in this altar to to allow me to have store more more um, life essence in there to make it run faster. Basically, for all of these sort of various upgrades that can be done. <clears throat> this is then running on the same system as before. So as this as this f gradually fills up, which it's not really doing at the moment because it's we've run, we're, we're a bit short of the life essence. It will this signal will grow and grow and grow until it finally gets around here, pings this one. This will then dip, send uh, something out of this chest into here, which gets imbued as you see, and then gets passed out. Into the, into the pipe and goes up into the output chest upstairs. So this is all working quite nicely and I'm generally pretty happy with the way this is working. Um, as you can see up here we've got lots and lots of blank slates and a few reinforced slates as well. I think I should probably convert some of these blank, in fact let's, while I think of it, let's take a load of these blank slates and do the thing where I do that, take out all of those another set, do that, because this is how you make um, this is how you make the tier 2 um, root, uh, slates. <clears throat> so the tier 1 slates are made by simply putting the compressed stone through the through the blood altar. The tier 2 are made by taking out the ones that the blank slates that are made from tier 1, compressing them all into blank slate blocks as you saw there, 4 to 1. Then I can put these blank slate blocks in here, they'll be passed down into the chest downstairs, passed through the blood altar and they'll come back up here as tier 2 slates like these ones. The reinforced slates you can do the same with. You can you can turn four of those into one of the next slate block, which can then be passed through, and they'll, they'll produce the tier three ones, which are what what are needed in order to make the displacement runes and the various other powerful runes that we're putting down there. So it's sort of it's a bit of a process of it's one of those things where it feels like I'm making things to allow me to make the same things better. So making blank slates was a bit too slow, so I put so I made the altar bigger and put in runes to allow me to make to, which required an enormous quantity of blank slates in order to allow me to make blank slates for faster. Which, it's a bit circular, but I'm hoping that as, as we keep going and upgrading everything, we'll get more and more useful stuff out of this. The other advantage of having that massive supply of blood is I can now go back to using the blood chest to repair all my stuff without worrying about using up all of the um, all the available um, blood resources that, are, that we, we have in, in, now in the, uh, in the, in the facility. Because we're producing so much of it now, it's now got to the point where we've got, we've solved, basically solved the, um, the, the supply problems that we were having before so now I can I can just go in and repair my tools willy-nilly without having to worry about it at all which is rather nice it takes a little while to repair this one though because I, I use it quite a lot and it's got a lot of um, a lot of durability there we go so I can now come back down here I can have a look at and if I'm curious I can have another look at the um, the tanks here. So, okay, so that's dropped quite a lot. So before it was nearly at the bottom of that iron tank and the stuff I've just done there. So the the life essence that's been made and the repairing of all those tools has basically taken a little bit out of the bottom of the iron tank and then a tank and, a, and then a one and a half tanks from the copper tanks, which is a lot more because the copper tanks don't really store very much. Each copper tank will, st oh, I don't know, let's, let's, let's take this apart and find out. Each copper tank will store 32 buckets. Each iron tank will store 256 buckets. So it's a bit crazy. You can't really judge how much 
how, how much you've got just by glancing at the tanks. You have to go along and look at how many are iron tanks, how many are stone tanks, which only store 16 or something like that, and how many are copper tanks, which as I say store 32. So it's a bit it's a bit of a silly system, but these iron tanks are great, and I probably need to go around just make a few more of them to make things a little bit more easy to read. But now that now I've pulled those out, I can take them back over to the mob farm and put them in to be to be refilled from the from the system over there. I'm not going to do that now because um, it's not going to make particularly exciting content, should we say? <laughs> One of the sort of the side notes of getting all of this all of this done, um, and this wasn't something I would do. This is mostly um, Mike and Pete who've been building this up. But we now have in, we now have an additional level. So these elevators, which we can take all the way from the top of the ladder where the chickens are, down into the high tower workroom. It, um, down to the main entrance area, down to the basement where the blood magic happens. Then we can now take it down into the tunnel system underneath. So these are the service tunnels that I was showing you beforehand. But um, Mike and Pete have been through and they've they've prettified everything a lot and made it look all look a lot nicer. And this is now how we're getting the power in. So this is coming from the um, the the these power these flux ducts carry the power from where it's generated. A lot of this is from the solar panels on the roof of Mike's house. We've got some windmills. We've got various other stuff around generating power. Um, there may be other stuff as well I, I don't know about. But anyway, generally this is producing all of the power that's needed for the entire base. So that's piping it in and bringing it up for the um, for all of my all of the machines that you saw that were turning the blood into the life essence. We've also got these pipes that are bringing the uh, the blood and the life essence round from the donation building. So here we've got this is this is the one that's full of blood. We see the bottom of it here. This so this is this is we are now under the donation the deposit building. It's got this massive tank here. Um, the blood is being fed out down this pipe and all, all the way around into the bottom of the tower to be to be re reprocessed into the into life essence or to be turned into to be used for repairs and things like that. And we've got the next step is these cables that are running down the side here. So these are um, smart cables for, uh, for the ME system. And what this does is it means when these finally make it up to the uh, the tower, which is going to be a little while off because they're relying on a supply of wool, which we see, that seems to be the limiting factor. So yes, our computer system is limited by our supply of wool, which sounds absolutely ridiculous, but there you go. So eventually this will link up from from the tunnel, from the main service duct, service systems down here, it'll go all the way up there. It'll become and it will reach up to the tower. And at that point, we can run a cable up into the tower and start having the uh, computer interface systems there. Um, and if I can find my way out of this endless warren, I shall show you. I shall give you a quick refresher on the computer system. Now I'm sort of assuming that. The pretty tower, the pretty uh, prettified area, will eventually bring me back to the um, an exit that brings me out in the main part of the base. Where does this? No, it's just a hole down. That's not an elevator. This is an elevator. Where am I? Oh, I'm here. Okay, I suppose that'll do. I actually got went in completely the wrong direction there. So um, yeah. So the computer system is this thing over here that I was showing you before, where we can right-click on that. And it shows me everything that we've got in the storage system. And I can search for stuff in here. So if I wanted gold, I could search for that. And it shows me all the various different gold things that are around that are available in the storage system. Or if I wanted to start making things, I can search for it over I can search for it over here. Let's say I wanted um, a chest, for example. I could, I could find an oak chest, and from here I could say, okay, I want to make an oak chest. So I'll pull the pull the pull the uh, oak panels out of the storage system and I could make one so I could just grab that chuck it into the storage system or into my inventory whichever whichever I felt like whichever was more appropriate so this allows you to to automate a lot of the construction stuff and if it turns out we didn't have enough oak planks for this um, when I went into the chest I could then go okay I, I need to make those so I need to make that from the um, from the jungle wood logs so we could oops I could say I want to add that in, and we can make some of these. I can make the wood here. I could chuck that into the into the system, and then make the next thing. It doesn't automatically allow you to do multiple steps like you can with uh, with pocket crafting in Factorio, but it does allow you to fairly quickly go through without the sort of the endless running around and trying to get all of the bits and pieces that you might need. There's also a cunning system that Al has made, um, which you'll see more of if you look in the um, in his video, where for some specific things, like a carpenter, I believe. I can go, yes, car a carp is it carpenter's workshop? No, it's an actual carpenter, that one. I can, I can start, I'm searching in the wrong place. I can search in here for a carpenter, and then you see it says craft on it. So if I select it, I can then choose how many I want to make. It won't actually make it because this is, as you see, here is a five by five recipe, and we can't make those automatically in the computer system yet. But what it will do, through a mechanism which you'll have to look in his video to see explained properly, 
is put all of the bits and pieces you need to make your carpenter into a chest that I thought was down, yes, this chest here. So they'll magically appear in here. Um, this is some, obviously somebody who's been making copper tanks using this method. Um, so I can grab all of those and then go to the um, and go to the advanced crafting table here. And then I can make that thing here by selecting the recipe um, over here and saying I want to make it. Obviously, I haven't got any of the stuff this time because I don't actually want to make a carpenter. But if I did, I could then I could then build that here in the advanced crafting table from the stuff that's been dumped into this chest automatically by the computer system. So it's not 100% automated, but it does the hard part and the bits I always struggle with because I'm forgetful of just pulling out all the bits and pieces you need into here. The downside is that you need to go in here and specify all the different things you, that, that you want to be able to make. So at the moment you can make an ME controller, you can make, you make an assembler, you can make an ME, this ME controller is, oh, is part one, ME controller, you can make a carpenter, you can make a copper tank, but that's all. You can't make anything other than these things with this system yet. You need, you need to configure it specifically. So it's... It's a help for things that you make a lot of, and copper tanks are do fit into that category, but it's not a complete automation of it. There's also lots of other computer stuff going on down here that I don't fully understand, but I'll leave that for um, for Al to explain because he's he's been a lot more involved in the computer system than I have, or maybe for Tristan to, to explain in a show and tell. So if you come along to a stream, we can you can ask for a for a for a guided tour of any of these things, and I'll, I'm sure I'll be very happy to explain it all to you. Another thing I've been working on, and this sort of comes back to um. What I've been talking about um, earlier. There's a couple of a couple of things I want to want to briefly mention. One is that I made a, a what's called a promise of productivity, and that's for the um, the blood infuser down here. That's this thing, um, and that allow that basically increases the efficiency of the blood infuser. So it, um, I, th I think if I can find this in the quests, uh, let's see if we can find that fairly easily. Hopefully it'll be Black Magic Two, and yes, this one, promise of productivity. So this reduces the amount of blood required to produce an item, process an item. I don't know how much it actually reduces it by, but since at the time I made it, we were actually short of blood, which seems ridiculous given how much we've now got. But we were at that point short of it. It seemed like a good idea. So I made one of these. It took a fair amount of stuff, um, but it was this was this was all relatively straightforward. Things I've I've sort of done before. The only tricky part really from this was remembering how to make dark magic essence, and it turns out you make that by melting dark magic dust in the furnace and then trying to extract it and pour it into your uh, into your uh, mage's workshop. So that that was okay. The other thing is that doing these um, upgrades to the the blood altar. So the first couple, it's just you shove in all of these darks, like these um, blank runes. That's fine. Then for the tier three, you need to put glowstone on these pillars. So again, not too bad. Um, uh, we had plenty of glowstone around. I should probably make these pillars out of something nicer. In fact, I should make all this floor out of something nicer. Perhaps more dark oak wood would 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 be nice. Um, so that's at some point but for the next one you need to have a slightly taller pillar and you need to put i think it's a large yeah large bloodstone tiles on top of it and that requires these weak blood shards which i've been i, I was trying to get a little bit and it turns out the way you get those is through killing a, an enemy on which you've cast the weakness curse uh, or, or an enemy which has been weakened and there are a couple of ways to do that supposedly one is the one that's recommended by the uh, the wiki itself which i think was to use a it was to use a specific type of sword which i forget the name of but i'll, I'll try that next time as if it works but it, we reckon that you should also be able to do it by throwing a potion of um of weakness weakness at them and then killing them with any weapon um, unfortunately that didn't work work I didn't get any weak blood shards out of that so I've not been able to upgrade this yet but we'll see I'm gonna have another go at that next time with the uh, with the different um, method of, of trying to produce it and we'll see how that goes fingers crossed we'll actually be able to produce the thing and then I'll be able to get the tier, get the get this blood altar up to tier four because at the moment it's stuck at tier three simply because I don't have the blocks to put on top of there and that was it for me so that was um Setting up the automated uh, life essence system took quite a lot of time because I was was because I was learning, as I say. So there's quite a lot of a lot of new stuff in here that I had to get get up and going. And I also spent a bit of time waiting for blood to be produced because it's a bit it was it was a bit slow before. Um, it, it's, it's, in the moment, it's only really fast if you if you sort of if you're happy to wander off and I don't know have lunch or something while it's while it's running. So at that point, it's quite good for pr producing when you're away from your uh, away from the computer. But that's not quite ideal. We're going to carry on working on that though. So Tristan has been working on what I thought was a giant chair um, and is now turning into a giant villager. So because there's a trading hall going up here, Tristan has decided that he's going to build an enormous villager next to it um, that's going to stand there look, looking creepy and generally terrifying you when you catch it out of the corner of your eye. Um, yeah, so I think I was, sta I, I was standing up here during the stream looking out over the base. And I sort of turned around a little bit this way and there's this enormous face looking at me and it was... 
it was a little bit perturbing, should we say, put it that way. <laughs> so yes, that's coming along uh, to an extent. I wonder how far he's going to take this. Is he going to make an enormous zombie to stand on top of the mob farm over there? Is he going to make an enormous... Uh, I mean, those enormous chickens should therefore be down in the animal husbandry area over there. Is he going to make an enormous bed to go on top of the barracks of never of never being of never finishedness and i don't know what how far he's planning to take this but at the moment we are we appear to be gaining a giant village up next to the uh, next to the trading area so that's fun he's also been busy with the uh, the map works which i've um, i think i've mentioned before but essentially you spend an enormous amount of time running around putting um put, putting uh, slabs down then you take a map of it um and we now have the full setup here um Let's drop back down again. We now have almost we now have the full set of them up here with um, Mike's headphones, Pete's upside down dog, uh, Tristan's giant lobster, my here's what I do on my channel logo, and Al's face. So it's now we've now got the full set for all the people playing here, which is quite nice. Um, the the dog is notably upside down because apparently people don't know they're north from their south. I thought this was only a problem we had in GTA, but apparently not. So. Um, who knows what's going to be done with this. Maybe it can be turned around with a crescent hammer, but I'm not going to try because I'll probably break something and they'll be very upset with me. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it's just an all an elaborate troll. We shall see. The other big thing that Tristan's been doing is spending lots of time working on the uh, um, on the storage and computer system with, uh, with I was going to say with some help from Al. I think it's more the other way around. I think Al's been mostly doing it with some help from Tristan. But that's uh, as you've seen from my uh, talking about it and, p and pointing at it, that's going pretty well. Um, he says he's also done a certain amount of violence during the uh, during the stream. Some of which was deliberate, some of which was less so, and and some quests as well. Al has been working on P2P, which is a way of cramming more and more signals down those down those cables I was showing you earlier. Um, I'll, I'll let him explain that, though, because he, he does make the video, so that, that's an incentive to go and watch his. Not now, but when you finish watching mine, you can go and watch his, and he'll uh, I'm sure he'll explain that in, in uh, far better than I possibly could. Mike has been making the maps, as I've been saying, um, and also di and, and also digging the tunnels uh, and decorating the tunnels with with uh, ably assisted by Pete, as I was, uh, was saying earlier while I was down there. Uh, Mike also wanted us to know he's made a... Uh, a basement area in his um, in his tower, no, in his house. Sorry. So down here now we have, I guess this is his um, nuclear bunker. So it allows him to shelter from any sort of ex extreme creeper attack he might get. I don't know. I think it's also he just like he just fancied building a sort of an underground lair of some description. I do. I've said this a couple of times on stream, but I do quite like the um, the effect he's got over here with the green and blue concrete uh, that gives you sort of almost an an almost outdoor feeling, a bit like putting a sort of TV screen up with a with a scene of I don't know the Bahamas or something on an office in, uh, that doesn't have any windows. It's the same sort of um, same sort of feeling, and it it does it does kind of work. I, th I think there's also a sun behind one of them that you made with a pumpkin. There it is, um, which again makes sense because pumpkins provide a certain amount of light. So yeah, sure. <laughs> that covers most of what's been going on. Where am I? How do I get how, how do I get out of Mike's house from without going? Th okay, I was hoping there'd be a lift that would go up onto the roof, but turns out not. I think the only thing worth, other thing worth mentioning at this point is that after um, Pete had been missing for um, several sessions, should we say, we decided it'd be a good idea to try and summon him. So um, I, I believe this is more or less how you summon a wither, but because Pete is our farmer, this has been done with hay and peat heads. So it apparently worked because he turned up for this uh, this week's session and um, and did, as I said, a lot of um, assist assisting with the decorating uh, with Mike and playing with all the other stuff that's been done since. So, yeah, we are back up to a, a full complement of players now, for, for at least for now. We'll see how long that lasts for. So, yeah, that's that's it for the episode. I shall um, leave you with this night, lovely time lapse of the um, of, of Mike's logo being made, where I, I uh, dropped into the uh, into the game and, and sat around for a little while as, as in spectator mode, watching them watching them build it and uh, getting on with some other stuff at the same time and um, and as say as, as ever don't forget to come along on um, on Monday to, to watch the actual stream so you'll see see us actually building these things well not not a um, not a time lapse like not not a uh, map like this because that'd be rather dull but all of the all of the, the automation and the buildings and every, everything else that's been going on we'll be getting on with some more of that um, I should be I should be streaming that on Monday there'll be another one of these catch up videos on Saturday to uh, remind you of everything that's been we, we've did we did on that stream as well. I should be streaming uh, Factorio on Wednesdays, as always. So please come along, support me on that one. That's uh, always great to see people and um, streaming the and uh, no so, uh, and making the uh, summary video of that for uh, Sunday as well. I'm really trying quite hard to get the uh, the GTA Manhunt videos going again. They're a little bit time-consuming to make, but I do enjoy enjoy doing them, and they're uh, 
they're good fun to have so hopefully we'll get those up and running again fairly soon um we shall see i've got a couple in the works and a load more that need waiting to be processed so yes there's lots and lots going on on the channel i shall also be trying to make some more uh, tutorial videos and, and similar things in the future as well so lots to see lots to do i hope to see you around for uh, in the future for lots of lots of the uh, content and uh, thanks for watching i'll see you then